Okay, so I am going to start with um, my welcome letter. That is, um, a, if, if I ever have a professional speechwriter, if I'm ever in a position to have a professional speechwriter, it's going to be Danielle Brodnick, because she, <laughs> she wrote my welcome letter for me because I didn't have time. But these are my thoughts, and she's just put them into beautiful words. And it's um, in, your, in your programs as well. Uh, welcome friends, we're proud to once again have this very privileged opportunity to hold an event of this magnitude. My name is Susan Lopez and I am the chair of the conference and I welcome you to Sin City with Sin. <laughs> this forum marks the fourth Desiree Alliance conference. Danielle didn't write that last part, I did. This forum <laughs> marks the fourth Desiree Alliance conference, Working Sex, Power, Practice and Politics. To think that it was only four years ago when Desiree Alliance held its inaugural conference in this very city helps us to see just how far we, we as a unified body of activists have come. In 2006, I think we had a total of five SWAP chapters. We've since seen that grow to 12 chapters across the US. SWAP and Desiree Alliance have attended three World AIDS conferences, multiple harm redu reduction conferences, and several conferences on prostitution connecting with sex workers worldwide. As a group of organizations dedicated to social justice for sex, for sex workers, we have certainly seen our ranks of activists grow. Our hope for each conference is that we inspire more attendees to become activists to pursue the realization of civil, labor, and human rights for all sex workers. Power starts with a voice, an individual voice that grows stronger as the belief is shared and accepted. As one voice turns into many and in turn becomes amplified, the end result will be groundbreaking. No matter how solid the landscape once was, you have that voice, and we at Desiree Alliance welcome and encourage each and every one of you to use it. And that, my friends, is how power, practice, and politics are embedded in our lives. Throughout the conference, organizers will be available to hear your concerns and assist with problems that, there are, that are within our means to address. Social justice team volunteers will have blue tags on their name badges, and other organizers will have beige tags, and the blue tags will have stars on them. If there's anything that we can assist you with, please don't hesitate to ask, and by all means, please be sure to take some time to introduce yourself if you see one of us. We'd love to meet you personally and say hello. On a personal note, this will be my last year on Desiree's leadership team. However, my commitment to its mission will certainly continue. I'd like to thank the Desiree team for its unwavering dedication and its sense of urgency in moving mountains to the sexual politics that we all encounter. This conference, this movement, this forum for difficult and critical discussions is happening all because of you. Entering a new decade creates a space for all of us to look ahead. My wish for our, is for our human rights community to grow, for our activism to become stronger, for wider collaboration with the numerous social justice organizations that blanket the globe, and of course, more love for each other and for ourselves. Thank you. Dr. Joycelyn Elders. Dr. Elders um, has been a longtime supporter of the sex workers' rights movement. She spoke at ICOP in 1995, and she rocks. When she was sworn as the Surgeon General, Dr. Joycelyn Elders became the first African American and the second woman to hold that post. As Surgeon General, Dr. Elders initiated programs to combat youth, smoking, and teen pregnancy, and to increase childhood immunizations. As a private citizen, she continues to lobby tirelessly for the health needs of the young, the poor, and the powerless. A pediatric endocrinologist, Dr. Elders, has a deep concern for the welfare of children. She believes that violence, sexually transmitted diseases, poverty, and substance abuse are the biggest threats to the health and wellness of our children. Dr. Elders has always spoken from her heart on health care issues, on health care issues. She advocates public health over profits in healthcare reform, openness and over censorship in sex education and rehabilitation over incarceration in the war against drugs. Her presentations on sexual health and education are both frank and informative. In her lectures and her book, Dr. Elders, and her book, Joycelyn Elders, MD, From Sharecropper's Daughter to Surgeon General of the United States, she addresses the importance of good prenatal care, the future of healthcare reform, women's health concerns, current treatments for HIV, and meeting the needs of older Americans. Please welcome Dr. Joycelyn Elders.
Good morning. Good morning. I'd certainly like to thank uh, Susan for that very wonderful introduction and also to thank her and the Desiree Alliance, your program coordinators, for putting together this outstanding program. I would say that if you want to know anything about anything, there is a conference, a program, or a speaker there who will be able to give you some information about it. So you should not let this week go by without making sure you get the answers to your question. But don't just sit around and wait to give answers to questions. You, everybody here, there's not a person in this room that does not have something to contribute. So make sure you make your contribution before you leave. You know, it may just be holding somebody's hand for a minute or patting them on the shoulder. But all of that's a part of what we are about and what it takes to make a conference go. If you just sit out there and listen to the keynote speakers and feel that you've got it, I want you to know you missed it. <laughs> you have some outstanding keynote speakers. You, you, you know, we can take me off the list, but let me talk, but you have some outstanding keynote speakers that, you know, I wish that I was gonna be able to stay here and hear. I met Miss Dion Hayward this morning over coffee. You know, she's out there always working to make a difference. Forget poor, underprivileged women, gay, lesbian, and to make sure that their rights are heard and to work in regard to social justice. You know, I met Norma Jane uh, Almador in, I guess, in 1994, 95, or even before then. And she has been an activist all of that time. I really, I guess I was so moved by her book, From Cop to Call Girl. And I looked and read of some of the things that our policemen were doing. You know, it never occurred to me that those kinds of things were happening in our society. But, you know, I, I, was, I was just so impressed with what she's doing, has done, and has been trying to do. Well, she even had me up to Butte, Montana, so you know us up. But, so I'm just saying, so I, but, I, but she's also just a wonderful speaker. So if you have an, have an opportunity to come and hear her, make sure you do. And the reason she's not here right now is she has to, you know, you have to take care of husbands and children and all of those folks so that her husband is not well. Before, he used to travel around all over the country with her. So, but, so we, we also are going to have uh, Mr. Tim Barnett. And he's, uh, uh, again, he's out working for social justice, was one of the chief movers regarding the Stone Edge. And so make sure you try and listen, you know. And there is Robin Few. Uh, she has been fighting about trying to decriminalize prostitution all of her life. Not, you know, not quite all of her life, but a, so. uh, but a few, but a few days. But she's very much into trying to decriminalize this to protect women, and she's going to be lecturing to you. And um, Miss Nina Hartley, an adult filmmaker who believes in equal rights and equal protection for women. And of course, I met a woman that I'd read about before and knew about this morning, Miss Carol Lee. And so, 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 but you're gonna to get to hear all of these people. There are times when there's nothing else going on but their talk, so make sure you try and hear them. And in addition, there are gonna be many, many, I never saw so many, conferences and special things 
going on for over a week's period, as I saw in your program. Just whatever, whatever you want to talk about, wherever you want to go, whether you're under decriminalization, activism, uh, arts and entertainment, business, or whatever. And of course, last night I had a long talk with Marcus, and I said, Marcus, what am I supposed to talk about tomorrow? And so he, he spent an hour trying to teach me what to talk about. But you know, you can't teach old folks anything. So I was, we, we get him to do what we please anyway. But I'm very grateful because he was extremely helpful in uh, helping me think about what I needed to do. The goals and the missions of the Desiree Alliance is something that we all should be working toward. Any time any person does not have their civil, human, and human rights, or their social justice, well then we all lose a little something. So we have to make sure that we all fight. You know, many of us have been out there, we women have been out there fighting. We thought we were fighting for women. But we, you know, sometimes we weren't always reaching out to the women that were most marginalized. Okay. And so we have to reach out to all, all women to try and make sure that they are really being, their rights are being protected. I mean, if you look back and we go back from the beginning of our history, you know, I, I, I was telling someone, in fact, I spoke at a conference recently on about 50 years of the, the pill. We all know what the pill is, and it changed the lives of women. Whereas before, women were really, the only reason they were supposed to exist was to was stay at home, wash the dishes, cook, and have babies. And yet, we know that we, it's what this world would be like if it was not for women standing up speaking up and speaking out. So I want you to know that what you're doing is a good thing and something that we've got to do if we want to have social justice in the, in the world. Your organization has done well. You, if you've only been organized for four years, look at the number of people. You didn't have this many people the first time. That's because they're concerned. And I think that you need to keep working to make this grow. You've gotten all kinds of professionals in your organization. You've got sex educators, health professionals, sex professionals, and they're supporting networks. And you need to pull all of these people together and try and expand your network because we've got a great big job to do to revolutionize the attitudes of the people in America. You know, we've got some very way out attitudes and the reason why many things go on is because of our not being educated and informed on what we should be about and to respect all people. And you know that we've not done that. So you're gonna to have to, you know, when you've got your organization going, you're gonna to have to join with some of these other organizations and unite to make them grow. You know, the, the big thing when we first, when we were working hard on AIDS, you know, that big poster that was out there that says, when spider webs unite, they can bring down the line. Don't ever forget that. And began to, you know, you, everybody in here, I, I was telling someone last night, we all asked, well, what's our top priority? What do we need to do? What do we need to do first? What's the most important thing we've got to do? For the 100 plus people in this room, you have a list with 100 different answers. That's all right. Always know that everybody here is on your side. Come in, fuss about it, fight about it. But when you walk out that door, know what's top priority. Because when you talk to politicians, I can guarantee you, if you walk in and say this, 
And I walk in and say that. Somebody else walks in and say something else. I can assure you they do nothing. That's their ticket to do nothing. So make sure this is what you want. You get it organized and you say, put it out there, that this is what you want to happen. You can't just walk out and say, oh, we want to decriminalize prostitution. You've got to know why. You've got to know how. You've got to know where to start. You've got to tell them where to, where to start and what they need to do. We were talking, we, we want to change. We want to revolutionize our society and bring about change. Change is the most difficult C word in the English language. Every time somebody wants to change something, they'll say, oh, the time's not right. The people are not right. The place is not right. The money's not right. And I remember so clearly, you know, when I was a surgeon general, they told me, Jocelyn Elders, you are not right. But that's all right. Just make sure you feel comfortable about what you want to do and what you want to change. And don't give up just because someone mentioned or told you you weren't right. Let me just tell you about what I call, I tell people the six most important lessons that I learned while I was your surgeon general. The first thing, the first lesson I had to learn is I had to learn some common sense. Always remember the, you know, people say always frequently ask, but I tell this was common sense. My grandmother told me, says as common sense is that sense that we all have to keep those other five senses from acting a fool. So just make sure we use, you use your common sense. The second thing you need to know is that power is never given. It has to be taken away. You have to go and fight for your right, your power. Do you think men would have ever given up all of their power if women didn't fight? I think we all enjoy and appreciated the vagina story, but somehow it got lost out there. And we women, we, we kind of gave men all of our power. So we're having a fight to get it back right now. You know, when you, and when you can't control, you re, we let them take control of our reproduction. When you can't control your reproduction, you can't control your life. The other thing that I learned is that you have to be clear about your own goals. Know what you want to do. What it is that you're trying to accomplish. I mean, Desiree need to know what they, this alliance need to know what they want to do. If you aren't clear about your own goals, I can assure you that it will get modified so much, so many times, until by the time it comes out at the other end, you aren't even sure you were ever even a part of it. So make sure you're clear and just be, and stick to it. You have to stick to it. Now just because you don't get it the first time, don't give up. That's all right. Go back and work on it some more. We'll get some more people in and get them involved so you can be clear. The other thing you can't do you know, all of the different organizations here, they've got a mission, they've got a goal, and they know what they want to do. But when you get together and decide that you're going to work together, don't worry about who gets the credit. Did you get the job done? And you know, sometimes we get so involved and say, well, because, well, they took it over, so I'm not going to do anything. That's when we lose. So just worry about getting the job done and what you need to do to get the job done and to make sure that we accomplish the goals we want to and stick together. And last but not least, I think that we have to learn to communicate with each other. Talk about it. You know, we don't communicate. Women don't communicate with women. Men do a better job of communicating with each other than we do. I mean, I hate to admit that, but it's a fact. 
we don't as we don't communicate as a community. We don't communicate with our children. And all of those are real problems that we've got to get busy with and make sure that we get the job done that we need done. And the last thing I learned is you have to keep your eye on the prize. You have to know what the prize is, but make sure you keep your eye on the prize to make sure that it happens. And to me, I feel that your prize is that you are able to get human rights, civil rights, and labor rights for sex workers. To me, that's your prize. And so keep your eye on the prize as you fight. Don't worry about the fight and how you get there. But make sure you keep your eye on the prize as, as we work through this. We know that for a very long time, and I was, and I was telling Marcus last night, the, the three things you have to do to bring about change. First thing you have to do is you have to have a crisis. And so he said, well, Dr. Elvis, we don't have a crisis in sex. Well, we have a crisis in sexual health in this country. Whether we admit it or not, we got a crisis. I mean, when you look at all of the problems that our, I want to say, God will, ignorance about health and about sexuality and about healthy sexuality it goes on. When we look at all the sometimes untoward consequences, the discrimination that goes on, the stigmatization uh, it goes on. Well, we've got a crisis. All you have to look at is look at how many, look at the amount of STDs we've got. Look at the number of unplanned pregnancies we've got. Did you know that 39% of all the children born in this country were born to single women, but more than 50% were unplanned? I'm not saying they're unborn. There's a very big difference between children being unplanned. That, let me say they were not timed exactly when they want wanted them to be timed, and there's a difference. Now, you know, they, so we need to time them. Just with, with, with all we've got, we can time them better. We've got, we have every year in this country, we have 65 million people living with an incurable STI. 19 million STIs each year in young people, less than 24. And we've got a government that has laws that says, well, we don't have sex until after we get married. And the mean age of getting married is 26. So I don't know how we think <laughs> all of these young people get STIs. But somehow, you know, in our calculations, we fail to accept what's happening. And then, let me tell you, I, I didn't, you know, I should have known, just because I didn't know don't mean I should not have known. But you know, you don't keep up sometimes when you get old and retired and, and looking out the window every day. But I didn't really know that you that you could really be charged with if you had walked around had more than three condoms in your purse. I mean that shocked me. We're spending billions to make sure that people use condoms. It's the best protection we've got against HIVs and STIs. And we're talking about arresting someone for having more than three condoms in their purse. I remember 20 years ago, I was talking to a group of high school students, and I was telling them, don't ever go out on a date with somebody you like without a condom in your purse. In, in case, that was just in case somebody, you know, you know, your boyfriend said, oh, I don't have one. They said, that's all right. I've got one. <laughs> I'm saying, but they said, but Dr. Elders, if I walk around with condoms in my purse, I said, they said, somebody will be saying that I'm a slut, you know. I said, that's all right. Just, just uh, remember that slut is uh, sophisticated ladies use Trojans. Or use so, so, so don't ever, don't ever use that, don't use that excuse. But I'm just saying that we have to, we have to educate our 
people, and I said, there's no mother, and I've talked to lots of them, there's no mother I know who would not, I, 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 I said to say condoms, but who, at the time I was talking about, I was leading to something to grind with my, a tea for my slut, so it was. <laughs> so, but who would not get up at midnight and go out and buy her daughter condoms if she was going to have sex, as opposed to her coming up home saying, I've got an STD, or I'm pregnant, or I have an incurable disease like AIDS. I mean, every one of, I just have never met one who wouldn't. So, I, so, so we need to make sure that we begin to, uh, as a whole society, but our society has not addressed this issue, and to feel that our policemen are out there wanting to arrest women and use that as evidence that that condoms is just absolutely unbelievable. I hope, I know that you've gotten some of those laws of return, but we, we can't even have a community that thinks like that. And we can't even allow our police, I think we've got to say something about it. To, to make sure that that does not happen. What if your teenage daughter was arrested and, and, um, and, and this happened? What are the women who were are out there trying to distribute? Let's say Dion was out there trying to distribute condoms to her women who need them. You know, who got, and you know, the smallest size package you can buy is three, isn't it? So, so I'm saying, you know, we we have to stop making stupid laws, and we've got to get the stupid laws off the book. And that, to me, is one we've got to get off the book. We have 750 unintended teenage pregnancies each year. That's down from over a million, and I'm proud about that. But it's going up because of all of our laws about uh, condoms. You know, no. It's, that we aren't going to have sex until after we're 20, after we get married. Well, I, I don't know many people in this country that waited until after they were married to have sex. There are a few, but I, don't, I just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we have more than six million pregnancies, and I've already told you how many, uh, about four million births. 1.1 million HIV, people with HIV, 56,000 new cases of HIV in this country, in this country, every year. We have more than 70, uh, 17 million deaths. And I know Dion will tell you about how, what a devastating effect it's having on African American women for whatever reason. And despite the proven effectiveness of latex condoms, only about 25% of the people use them during a sex act. And we, in the studies have shown that sex workers are the most effective at using a condom each and every time. You know, I, you, you can understand some of that. They've got to protect themselves. If you don't protect yourself, you aren't going to be in business very long. So you've got to protect yourself, your partners, and everyone else. And once you know how, and you're comfortable with doing it, whereas most, many of our young people aren't. But do you know who the next best group is? Our teenagers. And do you know the worst group that is? Politicians. You're probably <laughs> right about that. But, uh, but we're talking about in age group, it, it, it's older people. It's, it's that uh, kind of 55 and up group. So I'm just saying that uh, the, those are, that's a group we need to really work on. Because as I said, you know, our sex workers are the best. But our teenagers, whom we beat on and talked about so terribly, 
or the sex are, are natural. Well, of course, you know, they also feel that they've got to protect themselves. So again, we've got to make sure we have a sexually healthy society. And a sexually healthy society is the experience of enjoying our sexuality, both emotionally, physically, and mentally throughout our lives. We're sexual beings. And I want you to know that sex is not just for procreation. We grew up all the time. The only reason to have sex is for procreation. You know, and I know, that 99.9% .9 of sex is for pleasure. And so it's time to begin to admit that sex is about pleasure, and not every sperm is destined to make a baby. <laughs> you know, I was told several times, you know, oh, Dr. Elders, you know, condoms will break. I said, that's right, condoms will break. But always remember that the bowels of abstinence break far more easily than those latex condoms. So we got to make sure. But we try to have a sexually healthy society. You know, you, if you are not sexually healthy, you can't be healthy. Right. So we've got to have our sexual health, and each person's sexuality must be respected, protected, and fulfilled. So as we think about how we are going to change what's going on, we've got to make look at several strategies. You can't take off and or we're gonna have this meeting and we're gonna all go home and you all be revved up and you're gonna learn a lot of things you need to walk out of here and do and, and you, you, you will be all revved up about a week. But I want you to know what you do have to do is you do more than that. You've gotta involve other people. You've gotta get other people revved up and you've gotta start a revolution. You've gotta start a path toward moving on working for the health, protection, civil rights, of sex workers, if that's what you're about, and that's what you will need to do. So as we revolutionize our sexually dysfunctional society, and I think it is, first for the R, and begin to look at, we have got to start with education. We gotta have educational strategies. You can't keep an ignorant society up. You just got to edu educate them. So we've got to start early. And we've got to make sure that we carry it throughout a lifetime. We're sexually active or sexual. It says from the very early and from the time we're born, any mother who's changed her male baby's diaper knows that. <laughs> um, un until we die. They've even had people who are 94. I think this was the largest lady study that they were sexually active even in 94. Maybe not as active as they were when they were 18, but... Uh, so we've got to make sure that we have prevention strategies. We must prevent the spread of disease, and I know that sex workers have, uh, are said to have a lot more spread of disease, but when they really checked it out and worked through it, yeah, it, that's really not true, except in countries where women are not allowed to use condoms, or where men are in control, or you know, or women or we find it more in poor uh, uh, women or immigrant women or very young women who don't have the power to make sure that they can protect themselves. So I think we've got to find a way to empower them with the ability to take care of themselves. We've got to have strategies that are political. And I understand you have a political group that's really learning how to talk and deal with our politicians and make sure that they understand. And I was, as I was talking with the group last night, what we need to do is you have to find out the politicians that are sympathetic to your cause. Get to know them. Go visit them. 
and keep them in form. Make sure that you, anytime anything new comes up, you get it to their desk. And as I always say, make sure it's in sixth grade language. That doesn't mean that they aren't bright and smart, but they just don't have time to read a two page paper to tell them something that you could tell them in four lines. So make sure you use that, that strategy to in inform them and keep them informed about anything that comes along. The other important kind of strategy you've got to have is something that I call leadership strategies. Obviously, Susan's been a good leader to put this kind of conference together. So, but in order to have good leadership strategies, let me tell you the five C's of leadership. And you obviously picked that person, picked a good leader. The five C, C's of leadership are, for the first C, you've got to have clarity of vision. You've got to visualize what you want. If you can't visualize it, you can't make it happen. So uh, she decided what kind of conference she wanted. You've got to be committed to make it happen. The tools of commitment are time, talent, and treasures. So you have to, some of you have to pay your own way. You have to reach down in your pocketbooks and spend some of your money sometimes. You've got to be consistent. Can't go this way today, that way tomorrow. You've got to be consistent what you're gonna do. You've got to be, make sure that you're competent to get the job done. You know, we can have the best ideas in the world. And you, we've all met people and known people who, you know, they were visionaries, but they, but they, they weren't competent. So you've got to get competent. And for the last C, you've got to have control. And, and I think that that's what you're working toward, is to make sure that you can get control over your own lives, control over what you do, and because if other people are making all the decisions for you, I can assure you that they, aren't going, they won't be making decisions for you to be in power. So how do you recognize, revolutionize our sexual, sexually dysfunctional society? For the R in revolutionizing, we've got to reach out and be responsible. Continue to do the kind of research that you need to get laws changed. Because I'm sure they'll twist your arm and say, well, show me that. You've got to educate, educate, educate. You've got to be the voice and the vision for those powerless women in need of powerful friends like Ms. Haley. This alliance has got to take the leadership role and be the voice and vision. You've got to use every opportunity you get. It may be in the streets, it may be over a cup of coffee, it may be any place. Opportunities are like a single strand of hair on a bald head man. It only goes around once. And you've got to grab it when it's there. So take every opportunity that comes your way. For the L and revolutionary, you've got to make sure you deal with the law enforcement issues. And we've got a lot of law enforcement issues which we know are unfair. They aren't applied equally to sex workers. They're not equitable. And we can't have social justice in our country until it's social justice for everybody. You know, we've, I, I think in Norma Jean's book, one of the things I learned about is what they call test -a line And they said one of the first things police officers are taught is how to do test -a line <laughs> That kind of, you're not quite, even under oath. So we've got to make sure that, that we're aware of that. For the you, I've already mentioned, unite. You can't do it alone. You've got to come together, stick together, and stay together. 
It'll be painful sometimes. It'll be hard sometimes. But you have to do it anyway. You gotta be, you could, I mentioned the tools of commitment, time, talent, and treasures. You gotta invest, be informed, and get the information you need to make things happen. For the Z, you've gotta have zeal, willing to fight, zoom to the top, zap people who get in your way. And you have to just keep on pushing. You have to have empowerment, empower yourselves. Empower that your alliance, empower other alliances. Those are the things we've got to do if we're gonna change our society. And I want you to know that this is not gonna be easy. Always remember that a society grows great when old women plant trees under whose shade they know they'll never sit. So keep on planting trees and I'll leave you with a message that my bishop told me years and years ago when I was always fighting and always getting into trouble. He said, Dr. Elders, always remember when you're dancing with a bear, you can't get tired and sit down. You have to wait until the bear gets tired. <laughs> and then you sit down. So I want you to know that you've got a bear that's out there that's fighting mad and will be dancing for a long time. But always keep looking for new partners for him to dance with until you wear him out. Thank you very much. I think you know, I, I don't know that I know, know the very latest, but as you know, as, 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 or as you've known, that it, the HIV positive rate has been the highest up in the African American community, followed immediately by the Hispanic community. And the Hispanic community, you know, the numbers are increasing of the total population, but the uh, a, amount of HIV, I can't get it. I got the numbers from CDC the other day, but the last ones they had was about two years, you know, that they were publishing out was really uh, older, so, but I, I would not be shocked. The reason why is, well, they're afraid to go in and get tested. They're afraid to go in and get educated. And if we are not going to, uh, you know, if we don't test and educate people, we're going to find a, ri a rise. And of course, we may end up with more of them going into street kind of sex work, which makes up only what, about five to seven percent of the sex workers. You know, most of the sex workers are indoors, not outdoors. So, so I think that we, we've got to really work very hard to protect the most marginalized of all of us. We've got to find a way to reach them. Good morning, I'm Dr. Elders. You're one of my inspirations, and I want to thank you for being here. My name is Tracy Brasfield, and um, I've lived in New Orleans a while, and I've gone through a lot of things that you go through living in New Orleans for a while. And um, I've worked with a lot of different organizations, and one of them is Brotherhood. I'm sure you're probably familiar with them. And they do HIV outreach to the gay and transy community. And I'm one of those visionaries that you're talking about. And I have this great idea. It's very simple. And 
it reduced, uh, I noticed, I looked at a lot of statistics in the young transgender community, and it is spiraling out of control with, in, in the young gay community, in the black community, with HIV, and it's all because of the ignorance of what I call the Magic Johnson Syndrome, where they actually think that he is cured, and there's a cure for this. So they are still having unprotected sex, and it is getting viral, no pun intended, and it is getting way out of control. And I have an idea that, um, how do I get it across? It involves a celebrity that she could reach these people because they really are onto her and they respect her. How would I get this idea and get it out? And it also involves a national HIV testing that would be done on TV. And it would be the first of its kind. Well, well uh, yeah. I, I obviously, you know, on TV, it's very hard. We can talk about Viagra and all those other things on primetime TV, any time of day or night. We can't talk about condoms, HIV testing, and things of that sort on primetime TV. That's a problem. That's a problem we need to get rid of. We can't talk about using condoms until after midnight. And well, you know, the people well, her, need show, her show comes on late at night. So that is the idea that I know that we could, um, we could find somewhere to get through the FCC and get this off. And then um, I could talk to you later about this. This is a great idea. It's, it's a matter of getting it to her people and getting everything ironed out. It would be I mean, revolutionary. Well, and again, I think. And if it just reduces harm reduction by 5%, you know, we've done our job. Well, I think you really have. And you, you, know, you I was really surprised I, I, to, to know that uh, African-American youngsters use condoms better than anybody else. That doesn't say they do a good job, mm -hmm. but they say they use more condoms. But we have a high preference, prevalence of HIV in our community. So their risk is very high, very great. And I, there is no question we need to use every tool we've got. The newspaper, the media, the TV, and for our government to not allow you know, condoms or whatever, you know, it's the best protection we've got. You know, they're easy, they're affordable, they're convenient, and as I said, you know, they're, and they don't, and if they are used properly, they're 90 plus percent effective. Thank you, you have an effort for day. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Good morning. I want to say it was uh, really a pleasure uh, listening to you this morning. And uh, I was very happy with that very basic, very simple advice that you gave in terms of, of this community and organizations relating to politicians. And it's something that I've been saying to, uh, I'm a new member of SWAP, New York City. Yes. And I, I felt that, um, you know, politicians are politicians. They are not people in, uh, uh, and well, many times there are people in ivory towers and on thrones. But one of the most important things is to get these people as your friends, and as new as get these people as your friends as an organization, and as new ideas come along, new developments, new uh, uh, political uh, avenues. It's important to let them know, even if it's just a really quick email. And I like uh, the way you put it. keep it simple. Uh, these are not uh, dumb people by any means, but I was glad you echoed that they were busy people, and they are. So, in short, all I'm saying is, is, is for it's important for uh, this kind of organization to befriend politicians. Uh, and I'll just kind of add. I mean, and in that befriending, you might find that so many of those folks are on the down low. And they are absolutely can be your friends, and they have to. Keep your, obviously, it's something that you have to keep quiet. But uh, thank you again for reinforcing that very, very basic political strategy. You just got to make these folks your friends, and in time, you know, things and do change. And keep them informed and, re and realize that, they, that things will change. It's, we're talking about the changes. I said, think of how long it took for us to, to get the civil rights movement. Absolutely, and there were 400 friends. 400 years, years. And think of how long, to, you know, and I think 
the uh, uh, the gay community was right. really, you know, they really made a very basic breakthrough and move very quickly. But it still took them for 50 or 60 years. Right? Absolutely. And it started with friends, and political started, friends. And right. not only sometimes, I only, only also want to add that this doesn't this always be political friends. They can be friends in, in, in the arts. It can be friends, uh, celebrities. Uh, are just people that have a big, powerful voice. I call them the uh, bold uh, names that you read. Make these folks your friends. Yeah. I mean, because unfortunately, they do carry the weight of the world and, and help make change. Thank you Thank so you. much. I'm so sorry, I just have to make an announcement. Kiara in the red skirt, very cute lady at the end of the line, is gonna be our last question this morning. And um, what we're going to do is have everybody ask their question, and you can remember them, and then you can answer them all at once. Is that okay? Okay. All right, next one. Okay, first off, I want to say thank you very much for being here. It's really um, important and helpful to see someone who has been in the position that you, you have been in to be here as an ally. So, so thank you. My question is, um, and I'm going to preface this question by saying that I know that there are people in this room that believe what I'm about to ask you about. What would you say, Dr. Elders, to a person who is a sexual worker professional, even a sexual educator, that teaches that you will not get an STD or an STI, STI if your vibration is high enough? They're teaching spiritually that, like, if you raise your spiritual vibration and energy high enough, you're not going to get an STI or an STD. I disagree with that. So just we can just move on. <laughs> How would you change their mind? That's, well, that's I good. think you know the only way we change anything is education. You know, and it, you know, just because you told them, and just because they can repeat the words back, don't mean they're understanding. No, I mean they have the knowledge. You know, I, well, well, let me just say, maybe I, maybe I don't know enough, but I don't feel that, I don't, as a physician, I don't feel that you can get vibrations high enough that, uh, <laughs> that you would not get in it, you know, you can't get in this Thank you. Hi. Um, I hate public speakers, I'm not curious, but this is regarding education again, and um, you were talking about starting earlier and younger, and when I, I moved around a lot as a kid, and I had sex education every year, and I noticed that every class was different, and they were allowed to speak about certain things, and they weren't. And when I was in college, I started doing research for a paper about that, and I found it's not just the government with this absence only education, but I found out that PTAs are able to restrict and say, no, we don't want them talking about that. And watching these kids ask important questions, how are we going to be able to combat against not only the local ignorance, but against the ignorance of government to educate these people? I mean, if the PTA is saying, well, don't talk about this, I mean, there's some classes where they couldn't even show what a condom looked like. They couldn't even show what STDs looked like. Then I went to another school, and they were showing pictures of STDs. They were showing how to spot things. They were showing you the protection rate of condoms that don't even really protect men as much as it protects a woman. And, you know, each school is different. How are we going to combat the local PTA as well as the government against this abstinence only, but you know, as and on teaching. You know, our just because we have people in government and just because we have people elected to the PTA does not mean that they have all of the knowledge that they need. We've got to make sure that we begin to educate our not only our children, but we've got to educate our communities, educate our churches, educate our politicians, everyone about the problems that their ignorance is causing. Um, my question is different. Um, it's wonderful that you've come here and spoken to us. You're probably the most prominent person that I know of that has spoken to us. And this is great, but I'm wondering, are you willing to take this to the media? This is an idea that some of us have tossed around as having a very prominent public figure speaking on behalf of sex workers and getting the message out, changing the attitudes, because oftentimes if um, we have a lot of prominent sex workers and say porn stars speaking, but because they're associated with sex so much, they're still not taken as seriously as somebody who would, you know, a respected doctor and politician. Is this something you would be willing to do at some point? 
Well, you, you're asking, you know, but but you have to do it. You know, you have to get in order to be on TV. You know, obviously the media came and asked me questions. You know, from here or something. You know, I have to answer. You know, when I went to the first uh, meeting, well, you know, it was all over the TV. It was all over the country that I went and spoke. But as far as I'm concerned, I feel strongly about it. And you know, when I feel strongly about something, I, you know, and they asked me to do it, and I felt, and, and I did. And so that's, uh, you know, I think the things that you're about, the things that you're fighting for, is for the rights of human beings. I support that. And, and that's where, and that's that's where I am. And I'll, you know, and I don't mind telling anybody that. And of course, the media knows that I don't mind. Well, you know, that if I say it today, I'll say it tomorrow. Okay, hi, I'm Kiara Rose. Thank you for being here. Um, I just wanted to um, tell you that you're inspirational and um, you are absolutely wonderful and what you've done so far is great. I wanted to ask you if um, you, know, you are, you, know, you said something that um, I strongly believe in about women and how catty we are with each other, how ununited we are. Um, I was wondering if um, you are, um, if, okay, let me see the question, I'm sorry. Um, if you are willing to um, like get a, uh, a reunion of women, or women from all types of places and with different, um, with different ideas and, uh, and uh, judgments and so forth together for, um, to talk and get to know each other and um, take it from there also to empower women because um, although sex workers um, have, you know, we are most careful not to get STDs and HIV, it has gone up, period, uh, in women. 61% of new cases are HIV, are, are mostly women. And I believe that's because um, women are completely they're completely disengaged from their sexuality, so therefore, um, when it comes time for a sexual act and so forth, they lead the man. And because of religion and conditioning, women will not speak out about sex, whether they like this or not like this, or whether they're gonna use a condom. And I was just wondering if you had um, any plans to empower women sexually, to, to embrace their sexuality. Again, I've talked to loads of women's groups all over the country for the past 20 years, so that, you know, so I have talked to lots of women's groups, and it's, I'm sorry, and I've talked to lots of women's groups all over the country, uh, you, you, know, if, you know, both, uh, you know, sex workers, gay and lesbian women, gay groups, you know, I've just, you know, this I've, I've done for a very long time. I think that where you are talking about the how HIV going up so so much in women has up 61 percent. That's been in I think, and I might be wrong, in Asia, of Africa, some of the African countries, some of the, where women have no power. You know they can't uh, they can't demand that their husband use a condom. You know, whereas I think that we we don't see this. You know, we've had we had a lot a lot of the HIV. In fact, it, in uh, you know, in this country, what, 60 plus percent of HIV in women is in African women that look like you and me, in African American women. But again, some of that is because of our knowledge we didn't know. Some of it because, you know, you know, we started out feeling it was a white gay male disease, which was a big lie, you know, that we all learned very quickly from. And I think now with the, the TV, the internet, and everything that's going on, I feel that whereas more and more women are empowered to make the decisions that if you know if you don't use you know a condom, you know you aren't going to have sex with me. You're going to cover it or you know or, or leave it. So I think that that is changing in our country, but I'm not sure how much it's changing in some of the. Uh, African or Asian countries where women are less empowered uh, than in uh, African American women. You know, we are we're still very much plagued by HIV in the African American community, 
and you know, more of our men, you know, have it, and so, and you know, we have the problem that, you know, our churches, you know, if you're gay, you know, you, you, know, you can't come to church. Well, I won't say you can't come to church, but they, you know, we, we've got more biases, we've got more biases on our back that we walk around with. So, you know, that classism, elitism, sexism, and all those other isms that we need to get rid of. So, uh, so I, I think that certainly we've got to work very hard to save our African American women, well, all women, but especially our African American women because of the very high incidence of this disease in our community.